Now, moving right along, it gives me, again, wonderful pleasure to introduce still another great master clinician, and Dr. Ruben Davo. Had the pleasure of meeting him a few years back. Don't know that he would remember me. We shared the same podium. Uh, I believe it was in Spain at an Ormax Facial Surgical uh, meeting. In fact, Dr. Melavez was there as well. Uh, at any rate, I um, have great respect for this gentleman. Uh, he's received a number of degrees over the years, um, not just a, a medical degree, but also two Masters of Science degrees and a PhD uh, with all of his formal training and education. He's currently director of the, De the Davao Institute um, at the Metamar International Hospital in Alicante, where he serves as chief of the oral and maxillofacial surgical department and implant surgical based uh, work that he does. He's focused primarily on dental facial deformities, guided surgery, rehabilitation of patients with atrophied bones and quality of life tissue or issues. Uh, certainly um, uh, a full spectrum of application of his wonderful talents. He's a member of the faculty at Barcelona University Hospital and he lectures uh, worldwide and provides a number of international educational courses and programs at his institute. By the way, his PhD dissertation focused on immediate function uh, in, atro in the atrophic maxilla using zygomatic implants. So certainly a master clinician uh, in his own right and extensive experience uh, using zygomatic implants. I give you Dr. Davo. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to say hello everybody now that we cannot uh, travel as much as uh, we are used. Uh, it was really difficult for me to select uh, some patients, uh, one patient, you know, after 20 years uh, working with zygomatic implants. So what I have done is to select uh, four or five, more, the most important, uh, so important patients for me, and I'm going to try to, uh, to explain uh, what was important for me. I'm sorry because my computer is failing, I don't know why. Yeah, you need to click on the, on the screen. Not with the arrows, doesn't uh, take the arrow. Okay, perfect, yes, okay. Just one second. Okay, everybody, everything has started to me in 1997 when this patient came to me uh, asking for a predictable treatment. Uh, she was presenting uh, an extremely resolved maxillas as you can see and you know as a maxillofacial surgeon i was really surprised to see that we didn't have any predictable treatment for for this sort of patients sorry i have problems with okay so that's why i started to 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 think about zygomatic implants and in 1999 together with Chantal Malebe we treat the patient in this way we place a graft for anterior maxilla and zygomatic implants for the posterior maxilla the result was extremely successful it was in 1999 this is the result and 20 years later the patient is all right the patient is happy and with, with a normal totally normal quality of life what did I learn with this patient? Because it was the beginning, the beginning of something. Of course, I understood the potential of the zygoma bone as anchorage for implants, but I understood something more important. It was, you know, the importance of the scientific approach. Thanks to Chantal Malere and to the Swedish uh, school in those days, the Brandenburg Constitution Center in Gothenburg, etc., I understood that uh, we, we should have a scientific approach, because Sagoma implants were a baby in those days. Uh, very little evidence we had in those days. We had the, the studies of uh, Brandenburg in the Brandenburg Constitution Center, but we had very little evidence and some case, re says, some case reports. 
Furthermore, I understood that the graft approach were not ideal for this sort of patients. Uh, for many reasons, we cannot, the, we have not the time to discuss, but they are, they were unpredictable. This is the first thing, and the second thing is that, you know, they are long-lasting treatments, and many times the patient uh, have a low acceptance uh, acceptance for this modality of, of treatments. That's why I started with cytomatic implants in 1999, and until 2004, I was using the two-stage approach. Uh, and I published uh, the, the, my results. And I started with the immediate loading protocol in 2004. It was my PhD dissertation, and some publications came uh, later on. Uh, I was doing that and you know performing the, the protocol I have shown you before for some years. And in 2005, 2006, this patient came to me with no bone at all. And I decided that it was the time to start with a quad approach. It was the time to, to start the, with a quad approach for this sort of patients. Chantal Malebet had experience, uh, hello Chantal, if you are there. Chantal Malebet had experience uh, in using quad uh, psychoma approach, using two stage protocol, waiting six months for the loading of the prosthesis. And I had experience in it made a loading uh, with zygomatic implants. So we thought, okay, this is the moment to start with made up loading and quad zygoma. And this is what we did. But this patient was very special. This patient had a very atrophied bone. It was a saga O, of course. But you know, due to the uh, to the car the features of the bone, if we wanted to have a good emergence for the implants, uh, well, it was necessary to do this sort of approach. In those days, uh, we had a clear idea that intrasinus approach was not the ideal approach for this sort of patients because the emergence was very, pal very palatal. So we tried to get a very, uh, you know, a prosthetically driven uh, emergence of the of the implant, and the situation was like that. I don't know if you see that the planification had a gap between the implant and the, the bone. And this is what we did. I'm sure that Chantal uh, remembered this case perfectly. It was in 2000, uh, at the beginning of 2006. And you can see uh, in the arrows, sorry, in the arrows, the, uh, the distance we have between the implant itself and the alveolar bone. This is something I haven't repeated on purpose anymore. I have had patients with no bone at all in the maxilla, so I have uh, to do something like that. But you know, if you have bone, uh, I prefer to use it. But you know, in those days, uh, this, uh, we decide to 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 go for this approach. And what was the result? You can see in the images the uh, you know the, the the placement, the position of the implants, and uh, to complicate more the, the the things because we had two problems. The first one was one of the implants rotated uh, in the postoperative, and for some reasons, perhaps while taking the major the impressions, uh, and the second thing was that uh, all the implants had bending movements. You know, this is something quite common uh, when it comes to the zygomatic implant, but you know, all of them had bending movement. What I did was, and this uh, rotate, as you can see. What I did was to design a, a bar like this in order to design an overdenture and to place it with, with a, a removable denture, of course. Quite surprisingly, after six to eight months, the bending movement disappeared. The implants were totally fixed, totally rigid in the maxilla of the patient. So I placed this, uh, I designed this bar in order to uh, allow and to, you know, to wear uh, uh, overdenture. Which is the explanation for that? The implants, if you think about that, were. Uh, above the crest, inside the intra 
maxilla, in, in the lateral wall of the maxilla, and inside, of course, uh, the thygoma. So with the pass of the time, the lateral wall of the maxilla, maxilla embeds the lateral the, the implants. So it's uh, you know they have a contribution for uh, to the long term stability of the implants. These images show this process by courtesy of Chantal Malebe, is a case from her. And this was uh, the result. So what did I learn? The crucial importance of the cross chart stabilization. Of course, this is something I knew, but with this case, I was totally convinced the cross art stabilization system, the splinting of the implants are fundamental for zygomatic implants, especially, and if possible, from the beginning of the treatment. Alveolar bone is not fundamental, as uh, I think that Human uh, has said something like that. Of course, if you have this bone, uh, you have to use it, uh, especially for, this, for the stability of the soft tissues. But it is not fundamental because we have patients in which, in which we don't have any bone for many reasons. And uh, you have a good cross arch stabilization system, probably the implants are going to be successful. I have learned about the potential contribution of that wall of the, uh, of the maxilla. And uh, zygomatic implants must be placed anatomically driven. This is, uh, you know, this, uh, after this case, I understood that we have to get profit of the anatomy of the patient and we, to adapt the placement of our implants to the different anatomies we can find. And it is, uh, you know, it is the saga concept. That's why I am here very close to this philosophy. Of course, I understood as well, it is important the design of clinical studies, especially uh, when it comes to the zygoma uh, quad concept. This is the risk. Uh, this is another patient. I just started to treat patients in a, I wouldn't say in a daily basis, but just in a weekly or at least monthly basis, like those, because uh, this patient came to me with, no, with a destruction of the graft, with a failing uh, implants, with very little solution, very, possi very little po uh, possible solutions. And, you know, I was worried about these areas with no bone at all. The situation of these areas with, uh, you know, it, it was like a, a sort of a nightmare. But I repeat, I was sure that using properly the zygoma, allocating the implants at the level of the alveolar bone, and with a good cross arch stabilization, if possible from the beginning, with the major loading, uh, I was going to be success. And this is what I planned. And this is what I did. You can see the destruction of the bone at uh, almost any level, but uh, you know we had primary stability and we uh, could go for immediate loading and immediate prosthesis. The immediate loading, the immediate prosthesis is the cross arch stabilization. That's why it's even better to use immediate loading protocols than delayed protocols. And this is the result. In those days, I was starting to understand that the problem for the future was going to be uh, to design techniques in order to preserve in a predictable way these soft tissues. Because you know the rest of the problems, I think, are basically, basically solved. But the predictability of this area is uh, quite a long history and quite a lot, uh, sometimes quite difficult. So this is the result with the prosthesis. And I performed many cases uh, since I started in 2006. So we have many, a lot of experience on that. And I have tried to publish my results. This is an immediate, uh, prospective study I published some years ago, three or four years ago. It's a five years follow-up. All the patients were follow-up for at least five years. This is a very, Good article, I think. I I, I I presented with Leslie David. Leslie, thank you very much because you did a fantastic work uh, improving this uh, manuscript. And together with my friends in the Shanghai Ninth People Hospital, we uh, performed a systematic review. It's going to be published very soon. 
with fantastic uh, high success rates concerning one approach. Uh, many of these patients uh, inspiring, inspired to me uh, in order to perform the first randomized clinical trial uh, comparing grafted procedures and zygomatic implants. Today, it's scientific. Uh, it is possible to say that zygoma implants are better than grafting procedures for this sort of patients for many reasons, but you know, it is not just a matter of opinion, it's a matter of reality. It is the realities like this. And vast majority of my patients are following the SAGA concept. You know, we adapt the placement of the implants to the different anatomies of the patient. Uh, Carlos knows that uh, since many years ago, and I agree totally with this philosophy. I present a special patient uh, as well. It is an imimaxillectomy patient. I was, uh, you know, I felt comfortable with the treatment by means of zygomatic implants, provided you have more anchorage because of all of the reasons. We don't have alveolar bone at this level, not at all. But you can place the two zygomatic implants, provided you have more anchorage, at least one or two more anchorage. This is the result. The patient is absolutely happy with a normal quality of life. We are not improving the quality of life. We are normalizing the quality of life. It is evidence-based because we have developed quality of life studies. And just to end in three minutes, uh, this is my last patient, the last patient I could treat before all the dramatic situation we are uh, living uh, today. She came to, he came to me, as many of them, with a you know, long-term perimplantitis. And in the CT scan, we saw that uh, we didn't have any, any bone. In the left side, we have no bone at all. In the, left, in the right side, we have just five, six millimeters of bone. I don't, I don't use short implants combined with zygomatic implants for many reasons. And I think Costa has shown uh, some examples. So, of course, the uh, choice was a uh, 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 quad zygoma. And I was lucky, lucky enough uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to test, to check the new stroma zygomatic implants, round or flat. They are not commercialized, but I'm really happy with these uh, new designs. Carlos Aparicio has a lot of uh, to do with this. Uh, designs. I'm sure he will explain more later on. And I am happy for many reasons. Uh, the first one is that they are 3.5 millimeters diameter. It is very good. And the design, uh, we have two different designs in order to allocate the implant uh, as good as possible, uh, depending on the different anatomies of the patient. You can see the detail, of course, with this flat surface and you know, embedding the implant at the level of lateral wall of the maxilla, uh, the results are going to be great. Uh, this is my, my feeling, my intuition. So this is the orthopantomography and the, well, the teleradiography. And this is the result three weeks later. The, there is a little bit of inflammation because it was a review just three weeks uh, after the, the surgery. And that's all, thank you for your attention. And you know, the last patient and this sort of implants has inspired to me again in order to uh, develop different clinical studies, different training and education activities. And I think that uh, we are only starting. Thank you very much, and that's all. See you, hope to see you soon in person. Thank you, Dr. Devo, for um, a wonderful case series presentations and some great learning principles for sure. It's a very um, impressive and um, informational for us to see the evolution um, that you have encountered in terms of your experience with zygoma implants from two stage to certainly immediate loading. Uh, that is uh, Im impressive and important in and of itself uh, to appreciate uh, where things kind of started and where things are at now. Uh, but also equally as important for us is the appreciation for what you mentioned with regard to 
the overall um, prosthetic guidance, if you will, of the implants themselves. Certainly, it should go without saying, but not necessarily uh, that that's the key. And certainly, the Zaga concept en encompasses and embraces that uh, so well uh, in terms of customization of the implant specifically to the anatomy of, of the given patient, of course. And with that said as well, uh, which you discussed in terms of the overall importance of uh, certainly primary stability at the zygoma level, not necessarily um, any real contribution from the alveolar process and definitely in cases that are so severely atrophic, there's nothing there. Uh, but again, with that said, the importance of soft tissue uh, concerns, certainly, that have been mentioned um, by other presenters. But equally as important now is the design of the uh, newer implants, uh, the, the flat side, of course. I'm sure we'll want to comment on that when we're done with this case series of presentations, um, uh, for sure. The new manuscript that um, is um, in the works. Uh, but at any rate... Um, Overall, again, just an outstanding presentation. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting some of the important uh, parameters that we need to be aware of and sensitized to in working with these implants. Thank you for your experience and for sharing in such a short time uh, the evolution of where you began and where you're at now. Thank you. Thank you very much. A pleasure.